Made famous on the big screen in 1967, driven by Dustin Hoffman and The Graduate, and more recently featured in BBC TV's Francesco's Italy, the Alfa Romeo Spider is considered one of the most iconic and beautiful Italian sports cars ever produced. My first experience of Alfa ownership came about 10 years ago, when I was offered a rundown left-hand drive by my mate, long-term owner Giovanni. Obviously it didn't look like this when I picked it up. He brought his pride and joy over from Italy some years before, but now it had fallen into disrepair and was residing in a car park with flat tyres outside his home in London. So, in I stepped to the rescue, and after new tyres, a new clutch, new seat covers, brakes and a repaint, it was back to this. I was smitten. So when I received a call from a Dr Walker, a retired, respected senior consultant and mister, who lived just around the corner from me asking me if he was interested in buying his, well, I jumped at the chance. But of course, yeah, you guessed it, it didn't look like this to begin with. It looked like this. Still wearing its 1979 tax disc, after being purchased new in 1976 and driven for just three years, the car had then been parked up where it languished in this cold, damp garage for over 30 years. The engine was seized, and although Dr Walker had removed the front seats and the chrome before its long layup, it was in a real state. The wheels were locked up, the body riddled with rust, and I couldn't understand why it was so full of rain and pigeon poop until I looked up. Shock horror. Anyway, no point in lingering. So first things first, the petrol tank came out, it was cleaned, blasted out and lined. The hood frame had completely rusted up and was seized. So with that removed, at least I could take a good look inside. And although the car was literally collapsing in on itself, at least it was complete. Oh, that's the vent that goes in front of the windscreen. The steering wheel was shot, so I sourced a decent second hand one. All the switches were seized up, and after a huge deep clean, they were removed and the innards replaced. And the pedals were completely rusted solid. So these were freed up, driven out with a hammer, cleaned up, greased up, and replaced with new slave and master cylinders. The interior took me a whole week of fumigation. And after acquiring a decent second-hand hood frame from a disgruntled eBay seller <laughs> for just 99 pence, it was cleaned up, ready for its new canvas hood. The nose cone and lower panel was shot, but by a miracle I came across two original old stock panels on eBay for 50 quid. What a result. So with the old panels cut off, and fabricating a new radiator frame, the new panels are carefully lined up and welded in, and the old Alpha begins to take shape. And with the Italian manufacturers not being conscientious in terms of rust proofing their cars, coupled with salted British roads, well, it's no surprise that the back end didn't fare much better. So again, with the old rust cut out and a nice new panel lined up and welded into place, I then grind off any surplus and clean up the welds. Trying to keep as much as the car's integrity intact, I paint the necessary panels in Dutch blue cellulose as originally specified at the factory back in the day. And at the same time, blending in and trying to keep as much as the original paint job as possible. And yes, you guessed it. The sills were also rotted out completely, along with the jacking points. So they both had to be replaced too, along with new splash panels and rubbers. I freshened up the suspension with new springs and shock absorbers, nylon bushes, trailing arms and anti-roll bar bushes. The rear end felt a bit vague around corners, like the back end was swinging out. So what transformed the whole feel of the car for me was to replace the rear subframe and sway bar mounts, giving it a much firmer ride and back end stability. 
the majority of the boot area seemed pretty clean and original, and it still retained its brand new, unused spare, with the original brown paper wrapper rotted away. Also present was its unused factory toolkit, and amazingly, the original boot carpet had also survived. And after removing the spark plugs, filling each cylinder up with plus gas, leaving it for a week, and then with a large bar on the front of the crankshaft, easing it backwards and forwards. My old seized up engine was freed up and detailed and went from this to this. Rebuilt carburetors, brake servo units, new brake and clutch master cylinders. The wheels were cleaned up and went from this to this. and this to this. And this to this. Voila. Yeah, so here we are back at Beverly Hills Car Club in LA. Um, I just thought it'd be interesting, seeing as we're focusing on the Alfa Romeo Spider Veloce, uh, I just have a look at what he's got in here, what Alex has in. Um, this is probably a, a 1970s version. It's the cam tail, as you can see, the flat tail. Um, but looking at the engine bay of this, I mean, there's maybe four or five in here. Yeah, I can see a few about here. But looking in the engine bay, I don't know whether it's an American thing, but mine had the two brake servo units with the master cylinders on. I remember back in the time when I did it, it was a real bugger to bleed the brakes. It took me about three or four goes. Eventually I got there, but you know, I had a few times where the brakes locked up at the back. And um, it was a real faff anyway. Uh, so I'm sure like they, they quite quickly moved it to the the less pretentious, less difficult to bleed system where there's like one brake servo unit with the master cylinder on the front. More conventional really. Um, my one had, I'm sure mine had the Lotto carburetors. Uh, most of them I've seen have the twin Weber carburetors. But um, yeah, I don't know whether it's to do with American rules or what, but this seems quite different. Now what struck me about the car when I had it it had a beautiful two litre engine. This engine went right through them all, really, until the 90s. Uh, it's a very robust, very reliable engine. Uh, lovely sound, lovely zippy, lo lovely sweet sound to them. And very pokey as well, you know, quite quick. Um, 
Should we take a look at the other ones anyway? Because maybe there's one like my one. Yeah, a little bit about the history of these cars. In 1966, they were released at the Geneva Motor Show. And in 1967, they were made famous by Dustin Hoffman in a film called The Graduate, directed by Mike Nichols. So that would have been a 1966 car. So as the car was released, I don't know whether there was a bit of product placement going on, but as the car was released, it was put straight into the movie, The Graduate, and uh, the rest is history. Um, that was actually a boat tail in The Graduate. I'm sure there'll be one in here that we can show you later. Um, but again, a completely different setup again. I don't know whether it's to do with American rules or regulations or whatever, but it's got the, the same single brake servo with a master cylinder. Um, yeah, again, this is a cam tail. Let's have a look at this one over here. Yeah, this is the same. Another one here. Yeah. They all have a similar setup, completely different to mine. And look at the interior on this. See, nothing really changed for about 30 years. They had a Series 1, which was 1966 to about 1970. Then there was a Series 2 throughout the 70s, the Series 3 throughout the 80s. And in the 90s, there was a Series 4 where the shape changed quite considerably. Uh, I don't like this here. See this rubber spoiler on the back? I think it just kills the, all the lines of the car. Um, another one here. And as you can see, the graduate on the sign on the back. What's all that about? Oh, here we go. And there's the boat tail. And again. That looks like a completely different braking system on this. Carburetors, what are they? Webbers? Yeah, I'm absolutely certain mine with the Lotos, but whatever. Yeah, and just look at the back end on this, how, how different is it? And this has got a rare hard top, I've never seen one of these before. Look at that, wow. See the back end, how different it is? Beautiful, sloping, boat tail. That's incredible, I've never seen one of them before. Plastic glass as well, Perspex. Yeah, so there you go, a little bit of a brief history. And it's nice that there's so many and in such a small place that we can look at. Anyway, I always remember as well, I went to, um, when I first got the car finished, I went to a show at Tatton Park in the northwest of England and I was really proud of the car, really pleased with it. And it was still in single pack paint. And every other car there was super, super shiny. So it basically knocked spots off mine because mine was in the original single pack format. It just wasn't shiny enough. And against the rest of them, it just looked a bit substandard. But there was a, an old guy there, the kind of guru in the northwest of England. I think his, his place was in Blackpool or somewhere. And he came over and he was like, oh my God, this is the most original car I've ever seen. This is correct and that's correct and oh my God. Anyway, he said, start it up and everyone crowded around. They were all with the phones and that. I thought, great, I was proud as punch, pleased as punch. Big Cheshire cat smile on my face. And he started messing around with the carbs and he tuned them all manually and it sounded lovely. And he went, I said, what's the problem? He said, I can't work out what that knocking sound is. And my air filter container was there and you know when you get that realization you think oh my god I know what the knocking sound is and I said look it's a bit embarrassing but I bet you'd have left a couple of spanners in there and they all laughed of course he opened it up there was a ratchet and two spanners sitting in the air container I was so embarrassed but listen that's the way it is didn't affect the performance and uh, yeah so there you go one of my embarrassing moments, of which there are many.
But the truth is, after all my efforts to keep as much of the car's originality and integrity as I could, looking at the stone chips and the original paintwork and its lacklustre finish, I caved. I stripped the whole car back and hit it with a lovely shiny two-pack paint job, which looked the bollocks in its original Dutch blue and really did it justice. And I recall a conversation with Dr. Walker of how he originally came to purchase his beloved Alpha. He said he'd lusted after one after seeing one in a local car showroom, but when ordering the car, he'd specified one in Dutch blue, but there weren't any in the country. The Alpha dealers did a search and found one was being delivered to Edgware Road dealers in London. And because Dr. Walker was coincidentally working at St. Mary's Hospital in London during the weeks and traveling back at weekends, the deal was struck he did his week's shift, he picked up his lovely new car and proudly drove it back to Liverpool the next weekend. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I found in a pocket in the passenger footwell, the service book, where all the edges had been nibbled by mice. The car had been meticulously serviced and had done only 40,000 miles, always serviced at Mangalezzi in Cheshire. I suppose it's hard to believe how such a beautiful car, once loved, could fall into disrepair and be forgotten about for so many years. But sometimes life simply gets in the way. Busy schedules. But they're still out there, guys. And I'm glad I found it when I did and was able to rescue it. But the burning question in everyone's mind must be, should it have been scrapped? <laughs> Probably. Thank you for watching this episode of Classic Obsession. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like and subscribe. And see you all next time.